Well, I, I could not be more excited to kick off this new series on Joseph. And, and when we dive into his story, it actually picks up when he's a 17-year-old. So I thought today when we start, I'm going to show you a picture of me at 17. You, you ready for this? Okay, this, <laughs> this is me at 17. It's a ridiculous photo. I'm like, what am I taking a... <laughs> Am I taking a glamour shot here? Like, what's going on, you know? And uh, I think this showed up in the yearbook, but as I started thinking about my life at 17, I just started thinking through the lens of, now that I'm where I'm at today, when I was 17, how did I think my life was gonna go and how many things now turned out the way I thought they would? And as I thought about that, here's my conclusion. Almost nothing in my life has turned out the way I thought it would be when I was 17 years old. And I could just go down the list for you. I mean, I went to a different school than I thought I would ever go to. I I ended up changing my major to something I never thought I would major in. I played a different collegiate sport than I was ever, like, even playing in high school. Um, When this picture was taken when I was 17 years old, I was dating a girl that I thought I had a future with. And shortly after this picture was taken, that future went down the drain. (laughs) Then I got married to Jamie right out of um, college, and my wife, uh, Jamie, and I thought marriage was going to be pretty easy. And it took me about a week to learn that was a pipe dream. You know? <laughs> so when, when I was um, younger, I wrote in a journal, I still have it, um, I'm, I'm going to have all boys. <laughs> and now I have three girls. Pray for me. Pray for me, please. Okay. No, I, I love my girls. I would have never thought in, in a million years at the age of 17 that I would become a pastor. It wasn't on my mind. I would have never thought I lived in Phoenix. I would have never thought that I would go through some of the the painful seasons I have in life. My conclusion is that my life has taken more detours than I could have ever imagined. I want you to think about your life for for just a minute. I want you to take yourself back to the age of 17. I want you to think about how you thought your life was gonna turn out. I know not all of you are 17 here, and so maybe just take yourself back a few years, but. I wonder how many of you would say now, based on when you were around 17 or earlier, that your life has gone exactly the way you thought. It's just kind of been a straight line, like up and to the right. Things have just turned out exactly how I thought. I wonder how many of you could more relate with this, that you would say, my life looks a lot more like this. (laughs) It's just, I mean, it's just a squiggly line with twists and turns and ups and downs that I would have never, ever expected. I really believe that all of us have one thing in common, and that is that we have gone through a series of detours throughout our whole entire life. We really have, and you know, the dictionary defines a detour as just an unexpected or longer path. And that's what we're gonna talk about throughout this entire series Um, on the life of Joseph. We're gonna talk about detours, and and as we start, I just wanna acknowledge right up front that some of you are right in the middle of a detour. And I wanna just acknowledge it. Some of you here today, you're, you're here and you're single, and you never thought this path of singleness would last this long. And you're wondering when you're gonna get back to the place you really wanna be. Some of you have been dealing with infertility, and it's like month after month, you never expected, you just wanna have a child. You never expected it to be this hard, or. You, maybe you're struggling with anxiety and depression and it's, it's debilitating and, and this road is really, really hard. Some of you have just come out of or maybe you've experienced a divorce or, or a big breakup with a relationship. Some of you, it's been a marriage that's, that's been on a detour for a while and you wanna get it back on path. For some of you, it's an unexpected career change or you just moved to Phoenix and everything is new. Some of you are in trouble financially or legally or just spiritually you feel lost. It's why you're here today and I'm so glad you're here today. For some of you, your detour is because of your family. You never thought a child would be going down the path they're going today. I really, really believe, no matter where you're at today, that when you look at your life honestly, you're either approaching a detour, you're in the middle of a detour, or you're sometimes just coming out of a detour. And what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at detours from a biblical perspective and learn how to, how to deal with them really, really well, and even how to thrive in the midst of them. And 
What I wanna look at is, is biblically is, is I wanna look at a new definition of a detour because there's not one person in scripture that God used that didn't have massive detours throughout their life. And so here's the definition I want us to use for detours. Is, is a detour biblically is a change in our plans God uses to develop our character and competency so we can arrive at a better destination if we'd allow him to do that in our lives. And I don't think there's a better person to look at in scripture when, with the topic of detours than the life of Joseph. Joseph's story, um, this isn't the Joseph from the Christmas story, you know, Mary and Joseph. This is a different Joseph from the Old Testament. His story is found in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 50. And what's interesting in Genesis is Joseph's story gets more airtime than anybody, more than Abraham, more than Adam and Eve, more than Noah, more than all the creation account. And that could be because God wants us to learn from the life of Joseph how to navigate the detours of life. And that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna pick up Joseph's story and look at his first detour today. Chapter 37 of Genesis, starting in verse two, it says this. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Billa and the sons of Pillah, his father's wives. And so the first thing we pick up on with Joseph's life is he came from a messy family. Anybody else come from a messy family? Joseph's dad, Jacob, has 12 sons from four different wives, and two of the wives are sisters. This is like a story from the backwoods of Kentucky. Sorry, Dave Stone. You know, we love, we love you, Dave Stone. But uh, it's just this messy, twisted, blended family, and nobody gets along, okay? And so the first specific thing we hear about Joseph, which comes next, is this, is that while he's out in the fields, he brought his father back a bad report about them, his brothers. In other words, first thing we learned about Joseph is he's a tattletale. Anybody grow up with siblings that were always tattling on you all the time? Um, when I was growing up, I was a horrible kid. You just ask my mom, some of you won't believe it, but I promise you it's true. I was always getting in trouble. Um, one day I was playing in a backfield behind our house with my younger sister, and um, I'm, I'm playing with matches, and I literally lit the whole entire field on fire, the whole field. And the fire department had to come with all the hoses, and they put out the fire, and then they came to our house, and they looked at me and our family and said, does anybody know who did this? I'm like, I have no idea who did this, you know? <laughs> My sister's like, he did it. I'm like, tattletale, you know? But Joseph wasn't just a tattletale. It, it actually gets worse. We learn in the very next verse, verse three, it says, now Israel, Jacob, that's his dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other um, sons because he had been born to him in his old age. He'd been born to him actually to his, to his wife, Rachel, who he'd always wanted to marry. And his, in his older age, he finally did. And he had Joseph and he became his favorite. And so he made Joseph an ornate robe and all the brothers knew Joseph was the favorite, why? Because while dad took them to Goodwill to shop for clothes, he took Joseph to Gucci, all right? That's what he did. <laughs> now, if, if you grew up in church, you learned that this word ornate robe, that, that was a colorful robe, right? I mean, Joseph and the, his colorful robe. And it could have been a colorful robe, but maybe not. The word ornate in the Hebrew language, this original word, it simply means needlework that extends to the wrists and to the ankles. Because in ancient times, the way they would make coats is they would take a single piece of cloth, cut a hole in the middle, put it over your head, and so part of the cloth fell down on the front, part of it fell down on the back, about a 10-foot cloth, and so what you do is it would be open on the side, so you could either stitch up the sides or you could cinch it together. This was the typical coat. But Joseph didn't have the typical coat. He had an ornate coat, which meant what? That they would sew on sleeves because the typical coat wouldn't, wouldn't cover your arms or your, the total of your legs. So Joseph's ornate coat would, would go down and it was, I mean, you throw some color on that coat, all of a sudden he's the original hipster, right? I mean, he's, he's on the cover of GQ. And what made his brothers so mad is this coat wouldn't have just represented something that was nicer that everyone would have seen, but this would have represented potentially that Joseph was gonna get a larger share of the estate than all of his brothers, even though he was the youngest brother and shouldn't have gotten that. And so his brothers, they, they, don't, they don't like Joseph at all, and it, it starts to go pretty bad for Joseph. And you, you would think that, you know, you think like, how do his brothers feel? We don't have to guess because the very next verse tells us when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, couldn't speak a kind word to him. I mean, he couldn't even say anything nice to Joseph. So Joseph, you know, should have picked up on this, and the typical smart person would start to navigate this sensitive situation with the brothers with a little bit of emotional intelligence but Joseph doesn't. You know, a lot of scholars try to make Joseph out to be this perfect person that's never did anything wrong, and, and I don't think you can see that. I don't see that when I, read, when I read this story, honestly. I think what you see out of Joseph is you see an entitled, prideful, boastful young man. 
And we know that because the very next verse, verse five, says this. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more than they already did. Now, why would they hate him even more because of this dream? Because this dream, Joseph told them was, guys, I had a dream, and all of you were bowing down to me. All of my brothers were bowing down to me. It's like, this is just free advice for you today, okay? If you have a dream about all your siblings bowing down to you, just keep it to yourself, right? I mean, that's what the normal person would do, but not Joseph. Why? Because he's... He's so prideful and arrogant. He doesn't just have one dream. He has a second dream. This one, his mom and dad are bowing down to him with his brother, so he tells them that too. And now his dad starts chastising him, right? And so this begins to set the stage for Joseph's first detour. Because he's, he's entitled, he's arrogant, he's prideful, and he also doesn't even have to work very hard. And we know that because his dad sends the brothers out to work the flocks again, and Joseph gets to stay home because he's daddy's little boy. And so what happens next is while the brothers are out you know, doing all the work, dad thinks, well, maybe they're messing around again. I'll send the tattletale to go check on them. So he sends Joseph to check on them and watch what happens next. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. That was 64 miles away from his house, from home. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill their own brother. They're plotting to kill him, and the oldest brother, Reuben, says, let's not kill him yet, let's just kind of throw him in a, let's throw him in a well. See that cistern right there, let's throw him there. And that's what they do. Watch what they do to Joseph. It says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, the one they hated. And they took him and they threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it. And this word stripped, you need to understand, in, in, in the original language, it would have been the exact same word used to skin an animal. In other words, when Joseph approached his brothers, surrounded him like a pack of wild dogs and they ripped this robe off him and likely he's naked and and he's bruised and beaten because he's fighting for his life and they throw him into a well that doesn't have any water so there's rocks at the bottom and he hits the bottom of a pit and there he is at the bottom of a pit and, and his life just changed just like that. I wonder how many of you can relate with that. Even maybe right now, it's like you, you know, life's going well and in the next moment you find yourself at the bottom of a pit. And what happens next, and I really wanna encourage you this week to read um, all of chapter 37. What happens next is, if actually, believe it or not, his brothers just go have lunch. <laughs> He's crying for his life and his brothers have lunch and then one of his brothers, Judah, pipes up and he says, guys, 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 brothers, let's not kill him. You're kinda like, whew, finally, voice of reason. Let's not kill him, let's just sell him. You're like, what? Yeah, nice, thank you, Judah. Like, let's just make some money off of them. So that's what they do. There were some slave traders passing by, these Midianite slave traders, and they sold their brother to these slave traders for 20 pieces of silver. And then they took the robe that they had stripped off of him, ripped off of him, and they took some blood from an animal, they splashed it on the robe, they took it back to their dad, and they said, hey, dad, is this, is this your son's robe that you made him? He said, yes. And they convinced him that maybe wild animals had killed Joseph. And meanwhile, the brothers are celebrating because they get rid of the hated son, the one they hated. And, and it says this at the very end of chapter 37. It says, meanwhile, the Midianites who Joseph had been sold to, they, they sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. You talk about a detour? Let me just show it to you on a map. I mean, Joseph is living up in this region of Israel and he's just taken a little jaunt down to visit his brothers and come back and he gets sent on a detour 300 miles away to Egypt. And as we introduce this series today on the life of Joseph, I wanna just take this first chapter and I wanna show you biblically four patterns that we see from detours I think are, are, would, would really help all of us deal with detours in our life. And if you're taking notes, here's, here's pattern number one. Detours can be caused by three different things. And here's the three, three ways we, we, we experience detours. One is our own bad choices. You know, sometimes we just make really bad just choices personally and they put us on a detour. Secondly, we can experience detours because of other people's sin affecting us. You know, other people harm us or sin against us and a divorce or, or someone cheated on you or someone harmed you and it sent you on a detour. And the last one, this one's tough, but I think you'll see this the more you honestly look at your life is sometimes detours are caused because God's divine hand directing us. I've seen all three of these in, in my own life on the detours I've taken. 
But when we look at the life of Joseph, which one of these caused his detour? Now, it's easy to just jump to number two, right? It was his brothers that obviously were responsible for throwing him in the pit and then selling him to the, these slave traders, take him down to Egypt. But if we were really honest today, couldn't we say Joseph had a little part to play with all of his arrogance and boasting? You're gonna bow down to me? And what we're gonna learn later on is actually God wanted Joseph in Egypt. So in many ways, God's hand was directing him to a place that he would have never gone. In fact, let me just kind of give you a little sneak peek to the very, very end of, of Joseph's story. Genesis chapter 50, Joseph isn't 17 anymore. He's now at the end of his life and he's looking back at himself as a 17 year old and this incident that just happened and listen what Joseph says in verse 20. He says, you intended to harm me. He's talking about his brothers. But watch this, watch this next line. But God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. Could you imagine if we began to view our detours through the lens of what others intended for evil, God is gonna use for good? Why is that so hard sometimes? I wanna tell you one reason. It's because when we experience a detour, we immediately go to one of these three, three things and we just start blaming people. We blame ourselves and we shame ourselves. We blame other people because it's their fault and we get angry and we blame God. One of the most amazing things about Joseph's story when you read it is Joseph never, ever blamed anyone ever for any of his detours and he has more to come. Is that amazing? He could have, but he never blames anyone and I think that's a lesson for us in our current day culture because here's what I want to tell you. In our current pop culture, we have a massive issue. And the issue is, people are playing the victim. Victimhood is in now more today than I think it maybe ever has been. And when you get in this idea of blaming other people or even shaming yourself and you become the victim, listen, if you become the victim and you live as the victim and you stay as the victim, you will never move on and be able to become a victor. And this is an issue we're seeing. Now listen, I know some of you have been really hurt lately. And that, listen, I wanna say, if you've just recently been hurt and been victimized, it's okay to hurt. And it's okay to ask why. But if you've been a victim, here's my question for you. Please, just all eyes on me for one moment. Here's my question. How long are you gonna stay the victim? Because as long as you stay the victim, you'll never move forward. And God who has someone here today to just kind of get up in your grill a little bit and say, you're not designed to be a victim, you're designed to move on to be a victor and move past whatever happened to you. Listen to Romans chapter eight. Paul's talking about detours and suffering we go through and he says this, he says, what shall I say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have God moving you forward, not to be a victim, to be a victor, because Paul goes on to say this, you are more than a conqueror. You're not a victim, you're a victor. And then he goes on to say this, for I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor either height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate you from the love of God. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you need to stop being a victim at some point and be a victor. Move forward past whatever's gone on in your life. You have to. Why? Because if you don't, you'll never see the second pattern. The second pattern from detours is this, is that God uses detours to develop us. What did Joseph need to develop? Are you kidding me? He's an entitled, prideful, boastful young man. If God wants to use your life for something great in this world, and I hope you want him to do that, can God do that if you are prideful, boastful, and entitled? No. He can't do it. Here's what we know about life and leadership. We know this. You can have growth or you can have comfort. But you rarely grow while you're comfortable. 
You can have growth or you can have comfort, but you rarely, rarely, rarely grow when you're comfortable. And Joseph was comfortable. Being in daddy's sweet arms while daddy just gives you everything in a cush life in an entitled environment will never, ever grow Joseph. And so he gets out of that environment, he starts to grow, and I would tell you, when I look at my life, the greatest seasons of growth I've ever had in my life are when I'm uncomfortable. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. These past 18 months, unbelievably uncomfortable for so many of us. And I would tell you personally, I think I've grown more in the last 18 months than maybe any other season of my life. In my marriage, Jamie and I have grown the most when it hasn't always been comfortable. But we've stopped playing the victim, one of us, and we've You've been united together and say, we're gonna take steps forward in health. And this is Joseph's life. Joseph's detour is for his development. And God is gonna use it in a big way. And the, second, uh, the third pattern we see out of Joseph's life is that oftentimes detours will reroute us to a destination God wanted, but we would have never arrived at on our own. I mean, think about it. Would Joseph have ever, ever gone down to Egypt on his own? He wouldn't have. He would have not gone to a pagan land. He would have never worked for a pagan government ever. He was too entitled and cush at home. And yet God wanted him in Egypt because later on, Joseph becomes the number two man in all of Egypt working for Pharaoh. And because of Joseph, he saves the entire country, the entire nation. He saves millions of people's lives, including his family. And he would have never got there. He would have never got there without this detour. Think about your own life. I wonder how many of you met your current spouse because of something really, really hard in your life. I wonder how many of you would say this, you started a business only because the previous job fell apart. Or you're in the role you are now because the previous job just didn't go well. Some of you moved to Phoenix and you found CCV and it's transformed your life and it would have never happened without this detour you've been on. Some of you, that season of singleness that was so hard, it developed you into the person you are now today that your spouse wouldn't even want if you wouldn't have gone through that. Maybe we need to start looking at detours more as seasons where God is developing us and taking us to a place that we would have never gone on our own. Why is that so hard? Because of the fourth pattern we see out of detours, and that's this, that detours almost never come pain-free. They don't come pain-free. I mean, when's the last time that you were driving along the road and it was super smooth driving and you're just having a good time and you see a sign that says, detours ahead, and you think, yes, yes, I love kids. There's a detour. (laughs) You've never said that. (laughs) We hate detours. We avoid them at all costs. Why? Because they're painful. And yet when God is ready to move you to the next level, things oftentimes get worse before they get better. And you may not like that, but it doesn't make it any less true. John Maxwell said that people have uphill hopes and downhill habits. And it's oftentimes that this detour is gonna be uphill and there's gonna be some pain involved, but what if that detour was simply to develop you into who God wants you to be? What if that's what God wanted to do? You know, this weekend is the 20th anniversary of 9-11, a horrific act of terrorism by cowards on our country, and we will never forget what happened. Thousands of lives were lost, and thousands more were, were put on a detour because of it, and one of those people, his name's Danny Jacobson, he, he's a part of CCV, Danny on 9-11 was in the South Tower on the 61st floor when the second plane hit. And I want you to hear his story and how God used his detour for his development. Watch this. Looks like six, seven floors were taken out. And there's more oh, explosions there's, oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Wait, hold, so on. hold on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. Well, it was 20 years ago, and I do remember it like it was yesterday. I was in the South Tower, the 61st floor. I saw a few of my classmates running down the hall, and one of our instructors says, let's go, we've been hit. Some people 
had mentioned that they saw an explosion. Some people said it blew out the side of the building. But I heard some people say a plane hit the North Tower. And so I just went down the stairs with everyone else. At times we were side by side and sometimes we had three rows of people going down the stairwell. So I remember as we were counting down the floors, we got to 47, 46. We were somewhere between 44 and 45. And then I heard it. It was just this loud rumble above us. And then the next thing you know, the building begins to rock to the side. People were falling to their knees on their butts. I remember hanging on to the railing, but I, it felt like the, the building was gonna continue to go all the way. I remember it was at that moment, I knew I was gonna die. I was in such shock at the time. All I could think of was to begin the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it was at that moment, a warmth came over my body. And it was this feeling like I was gonna be okay. So after this was over, and I was home, there was a big change in my life. I became a kinder, gentler version of myself. I used to take life really seriously. And here I was, feeling, why me? Why, why did you spare me that day? But that became very apparent to me why I was spared that day less than 10 years later. My wife was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And I remember I remember having such courage at that moment and telling her she was going to be fine. I knew the outcome. I knew what was going to happen. I knew I was going to lose her. But I didn't know where that courage came from until I had looked back at the events of my life. And I thought for a second, well, wait a minute. That's why God spared you so you could have the courage to walk through this next hurdle, so you could have the strength, so you could be built up in your faith, so much to know that God has it handled. My current life is, um, I could go back and, and laugh at myself on this one, because again, here I am after all this, Never wanted to be married, never wanting to have kids. I have now remarried, I have two kids. Uh, we go to baseball and football and, and soccer and volleyball practices. Life is very different now uh, for me. It took me that long to, to figure it out, but it, it was never me figuring it out. It was God leading me down that path. No matter what roadblock I faced, he says, look, you know, you're gonna learn sooner or later. You're gonna hit this roadblock, you're gonna ask for me, you're gonna hit that roadblock, you're gonna ask for me again, but you're gonna realize I've always been there. All you needed to do was just ask. And, um, and so it's, it's crazy now to, uh, to have a wife, two kids, you know, to, to, to have a, a successful career and to, um, you know, to be that, that person who I always should have been, but, uh, but now uh, God has, has taken me down that direction.
such a powerful story, and, and we want to honor all the lives that were lost, all the lives that were impacted on 9-11, and thank you, Danny, for, for sharing your story with us. One of my favorite lines that he said is he said, because of this, I became a kinder, gentler version of myself. And I just wonder if he would have become that without this detour. I wonder if he would have been prepared to have the courage to deal with a wife that's dealing with terminal cancer. God used Danny's detour to develop him and reroute him to who he is today. If you're in the midst of a detour today, and it's painful, and you've been wondering how you can hold on for any longer, listen, I'm here to tell you today, you hold on to hope. With everything you've got, you hold on to hope. If you're not dead, God's not done with you. And maybe you're here today to simply hear this. The writer of Hebrews tells us this, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly, never letting go of hope. Why? Because he who promised, that is God, he is faithful and he does not waste detours in your life, no matter where you're at. So I wanna just ask you to wrestle with a couple questions today for all of us. And I, I wanna pray, and pray and just ask that you wrestle with these over lunch or dinner or, or with your CCB group because these are questions that you need to wrestle to the ground. And here's question number one. What is God teaching you from your current or past detours? What's he teaching you? And then I wanna peel the onion back a little more because this gets more to the core. Then I wanna ask you this. How would you think and act differently if you leveraged your detour for good instead of always fighting it, instead of potentially being victimized by it? How would you leverage this detour to become who God wants you to be if that's how you saw it? What would you do? How would you act differently? This is just the introduction to Joseph's life. There's so much more to learn. But I believe God has someone here today to tell you he's not done with you. He's developing you. You're here for a reason. Detours are for your development. They really can be if you let them. They often reroute you to a place you would have never gone on your own. But they don't come pain free. But when you hold on to hope, when you hold on to hope, God will take you to a destination you could have never imagined. Let's, let's pray together. Father, I wanna thank you for just the story of Joseph and how his life can teach us so much about what many of us are going through in our lives. And I pray for those right now that are on a detour and it's, and it's hard, it's tough. I wanna pray for the, the single mom here, a single dad that just is exhausted. I wanna pray for, for the teacher who's so tired. They wanna, they wanna love and pour into these kids and they have so much more to deal with right now. I pray for the first responder, the nurse or doctor who wants to quit. Help them to hold on to hope. Pray for marriages that are down a path they never thought they'd go. Would you give them hope for all of us? God, help us to learn throughout this series more about detours and how you can use them. We give you all the credit and glory for what you're doing, God, in our church, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, next week we're gonna continue the series Detours. It's a perfect opportunity, by the way, to invite someone around you to come join you at church, and I hope as you go out, CCV, you remember that we are for you, we're for this valley. Go be for someone around you. Have a great week, CCV.